Good morning, everyone. My name is David. I'll be your director for this week. On behalf of LCC, I'm here to say welcome and thank you for joining our worship service today. Before we start our service, I'd like to share a Bible verse. It's regards to Pastor Tim's message, giving us a hint of what he's going to share with us today. So if you want to join or find in your Bible, it will be in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. And it goes like this. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, with himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Definitely this Bible verse really shows and demonstrates how God is amazing and powerful. So if you want to learn more, stay tuned to the very end so we can see how this Bible verse and the theme can apply to our lives as in our walk with God. So before we start our worship service, I'd like to pray for us. So let's bow our heads to the other church. Dear God, thank you for this opportunity and time that you've given us to hear um, about your message for today. I pray that you continue to give us our strength and as well as rest, because this week has been a roller coaster uh, with the pandemic and the heat, and as well, we heard some explosion going on over the week and it's very tragic news. But we know that you are there, God, and you know that you're still in control. So I continue to pray that you be there with us when we need you, and as well those who need you right now in this world. So as we continue our worship, worship service, I just pray that you open our hearts and just let us embrace your love and glory, God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now church, I encourage you to stand up right now so that way we can sing and enjoy of God present. Let's start the worship.
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for LCC and what it's given us, whether it's community, um, worship, um, wisdom, or just really great lessons that we get to learn from the pastors. I pray for people who are suffering through COVID, um, whether they're suffering physically, mentally, or spiritually, God. Um, I pray that you are there with them and comfort them. God, I especially pray for um, the spiritually weak. I know that COVID has brought um, a lot of spirituality um, down for a lot of our members and a lot of Christians around the world. But I pray that um, we find the discipline and the accountability to um, get to know you more, pray to you, and um, yeah, read, read the Bible and get into your word. God, I pray that as we listen to this sermon, that we um, walk away a different person and that we gain um, wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We hope you're enjoying our worship service today. Here's a look at this week's announcements. A reminder that you can continue to support the ministry and staff of LCC through offering. You can give your offering through e-transfer from your banking app or website. Details can be found on our website at lighthouseyyc.ca slash give. The Young Adult Ministry will be hiking at Grassy Lake on Wednesday, August 12th. We will meet at church at 8.15 a.m. and we'll carpool from there. Everyone is welcome. If you're interested in hiking with us, contact Quinn or a pastor or a leader. The worship ministry is looking for volunteers to join our team starting this September. We're looking for singers, instrumentalists, and technicians. If you're interested in joining, please contact me, David, or a pastor or a leader. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted many of us this season. If you're struggling during this time, please let our pastor or leader know. We would like to pray for you and assist you in the way we can. If you have any questions or comments about our church events or ministry, we would like to hear from you. Email us at info at lighthouseyyc.ca. You can also connect with us during the week on our Facebook page, Instagram account, and our YouTube channel. Now our service continue with Pastor Tim's message in just a moment. If you would like to share what God has been doing in your life recently, or if you have a prayer request, record a short 30-second to 1-minute video and upload it to lighthouseyyc.ca slash godsightings. You can also DM us your selfie video at lighthouseyyc on Instagram, or send a text email to godsightings at lighthouseyyc.ca. We'll share it within our church community and on our live stream. Hi, welcome to Lighthouse Community Church. Thanks for tuning in. We're always glad to have you. So Christine and I, we've been doing a lot of toy shopping for a lot of kids' birthdays. And as I'm walking to Toys R Us, I'm low-key judging all these toys, right? Like, I thought that 15 years later since I played toys, um, played with toys, they would be better now. It'd be more advanced, but they're so lame now. Like, the Beyblades are tiny. The action figures, they don't even, like, move. Um, girls toys there's like OMG or LOL toys and they're like these little dolls with huge heads I'm like how do you even play with this it's not it doesn't even look cool right so then I was kind of thinking back about my childhood and I came across this memory where um, it was about a toy and about how I acted with the toy in regards to one of my friends okay so here's the story I had a friend well and he he always got everything he wanted right he um, his parents, I guess, in that way, they, they showed him love through gifts. So then, because of that, I would always go on my way to go over to his house to play with toys. I'm like, yo, these are the best toys ever. And one day, I was playing with this one toy called a Bionic, right? Which is kind of like an action figure made of gear-looking things. And he saw that I really liked it. And out of his grace and kindness, he was like, yo, Tim, just take it home, play with it. When you're done, bring it back. And yeah, I'm like no way seriously that's sick so I, I brought it home and I'm so excited I'm so stoked because most of my toys are like secondhand toys from like the thrift store 
and this one was like brand new and he was like it was green and had like these swords and it was, it was so cool right and my favorite thing about the toy was it had a lot of points of articulation so it means just like a lot of joints its wrists could move its elbows could move shoulders neck like any, everything i'm like this is an event toy so i brought it home to play with it and um the way i played with toys is that i created this like plot line and where i was usually the hero and all the other toys were like my friends or villains or something and you gotta understand that every story I've used was exactly the same. I was a hero fighting some really strong villain and he's uh, def he like kills me and then and then all my friends are so sad and then um, I come back right in the nick of time to save the day and that's literally like the same story I used for like, a year or two, right? And in my basement, I had this thing called a shuffleboard. So it's this big board uh, it's kind of like the foosball air hockey version of curling, right? So it's like mini curling. So instead of the big stones that you kind of throw, you actually throw these like weighted stone discs and then you try to get it into the area, uh, the target. So then that table was my main playing area. Um, the way I would, so, so like those, I would like throw those discs and then those are like the villains sometimes. So in this scenario, I was the hero again as the green bionic and then the, these stones these evil stones of death they're like coming at me so fast and things seem so grim and I can't defeat them and just as I'm in the middle of my story I threw one too hard and it hit the arm of the bionic and it broke off and I was like no right I just broke my friend's toy he'll be so mad at me or or worse his parents and my parents would be mad at me for like borrowing someone else's things and breaking it and I needed a solution to fix this broken toy ASAP so back then I knew of two kinds of glue I knew stick glue which obviously like glue sticks right obviously wouldn't work but the other one was Elmer's glue that white glue I'm like okay that would probably work I can probably put it back together so I'm, I'm trying to fix it for like I don't know 30 minutes and then when I think it's done I, I hold it up and it's stuck for like two seconds and then it falls off. I'm like, oh, what am I going to do? I need a plan for this broken toy ASAP. So I remember thinking I could either give it back to him discreetly, put it in one of his toy boxes and then um, blame it on him that it broke as he's looking for other toys. Or I could just keep it and not ever give it back. And I went with that plan. And that was a terrible plan, not because it didn't work. The amazing thing is it did work. He never asked about it again, probably because he had so many other toys and he didn't really care about it. But out of my guilt, right, out of me feeling like I betrayed him or, or whatever, I slowly stopped hanging out with him. Because every time I did, I just thought about the broken toy and I just, I was, I was so scared the truth would come out one day and I just felt so bad all the time. So. Obviously, I didn't want to feel that, so slowly and gradually, I just stopped hanging out with him. And while well, that was my plan for brokenness, and it ended terribly, right? The way I handled breaking my friend's toy actually led to breaking my friendship with him. And there's no happy ending, really. Um, I don't know where he is, but I, I tell you that story so that we can kind of move into our theme for today, right? My plan for brokenness is terrible, but today we're looking at God's plan for our brokenness. I mean, like when we look around, right, we can't help but see brokenness everywhere, right? In ourselves, in our friends, our systems, our structures. And, and while a lot of people do a good job, especially lately, of fighting big items of injustice by like posting on social media or getting uh, people informed, uh, what I'm sometimes scared of is like, okay, what if we miss the big fact that these big broken systems are just made up of a many broken people. And perhaps it makes sense to start with the micro level, each person first, before we try to solve the huge daunting problems of our world. So today, we're looking at the question, what is God's plan for our brokenness? And what we get from our Bible passage is, God wants to restore us from our brokenness so that we can share his story. So I'll, I'll repeat that one more time. 
God wants to restore us from our brokenness so that we can share his story. As we continue in the series of Peter, um, we find ourselves in Acts, right? And a big, big, big theme of Acts is that God is still working in the world by empowering people with the Holy Spirit, right? And our Bible story today comes from Acts 3, 1 to 10. Let me read it for you. So starting with verse 1. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now a man, who was lame from birth, was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, Look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. So taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And then they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So what is God's plan for our brokenness? Our first point is God wants to restore us. So before we go into that, just a quick survey. Who's ever had a tiny injury? Like a tiny, tiny injury. Like a canker sore in your mouth or like a splinter on your foot. If you're raising your hand, just know I can't see you. So, But other people around you can. Um, just assure them you're not crazy. But <laughs> I'm always so mind blown that something so small, like a canker sore or a splinter, could affect you so hugely, right? So a canker sore, I had a canker sore a few months ago. And it was like ruining my life, right? It was a nuisance to talk. It hurt to eat. I was like out of commission for most of the week. It hurt me physically, killed my appetite, couldn't go out to eat with others, uh, made me grumpy. And so it's like that little tiny bit of brokenness in me was enough to hurt me in all these different ways. In our story today, we're introduced to a beggar who was crippled, so unable to walk since birth. And think about it, right? If a tiny canker sore could ruin my week, imagine how hopeless his day-to-day -day was. And it's so terrible to think about, but here's the thing. He was broken in more than one ways. Physically, we know that he couldn't walk, and therefore he couldn't work. So he was also financially broken. Socially, he was outcasted and avoided because, you know, beggars make you feel awkward, right? You don't want to feel awkward. Spiritually, he, he was shut out from the temple because back then there was this ridiculous common belief that um, the reason for a person's lifelong disability was that God was punishing them for their parents' sin, right? God was punishing this person because their parents messed up somehow. So naturally, a person being punished by God was not allowed into God's sacred temple. So what could this beggar do? The best thing he could do for himself was sit outside the temple. Um, at the gate called Beautiful, hoping to work on people's compassion. That was his plan for his brokenness. That was him doing the best he could with what he was given. But we see that God had a different plan for his brokenness. So as Peter and John were walking by, he caught their attention and, and they, gave them, uh, he, they gave him their attention. So that's, that's pretty exciting, right? When you're begging for money because when someone is totally focused on you, what does that usually mean? It usually means you're going to make bank, right? They're going to give you a lot of money. So as he's waiting in anticipation for this huge bag of money, what does Peter say? Peter says, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. 
And then we read that the beggar took Peter's hand with his right hand and he got up. And I like to kind of stop and just imagine what that whole interaction was like, right? Like as Peter announces the grace of Jesus unto the beggar, what would be going through the beggar's mind? And as I imagine it, I'll I'll tell you what I would be thinking in that moment if I was the crippled beggar. I would be thinking, are you serious? Like, I already have it tough. I've been crippled since birth. There's no cure for this. I've been crawling around, begging for money around this temple where people are like so religious and yet I know inside they're selfish and judgmental because they look at me with dark eyes. And here, this man, he comes to me and he mocks me. He tells me that in the name of some guy named Jesus from Nazareth who he claims is the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Savior, I could walk? Does he not know that I've been crippled my whole life? What a joke. He's mocking me. He's making fun of me. So when when Peter would extend his hand to me, what would I do? I would knock it away. But this beggar doesn't do that. right? He hears Peter's claim of healing through Jesus, the Anointed One, the Savior, and he believes. Right? He is confident in what Peter says. And he had to believe in order to take Peter's hand. He believed that Jesus had the ability to save and restore him. So when Peter reached out his hand, the beggar reached up and took it. And that's actually called faith, right? To have the confidence in something and then act upon it. And what happened because of it? Well, he was restored in every way. Right? Physically healed, socially accepted, spiritually reconciled with God. Right? From this story, we get to see what we see throughout the whole Bible. Right? God's desire for healing and restoration for all humanity in all aspects. How is this relevant to us? Well, it's very relevant because we all need healing and restoration. And, and with everyone, it's different. Right, Some of us need it emotionally, when we're dealing with like ghosts of the past, some of us need it uh, mentally in our heads as we're fighting off lies and insecurities and even exha- exhaustion. And spiritually, we need to be brought back into God's life purpose for us. And all these things that we want to be restored in, we got to understand that God doesn't always restore us in the way we want to be. Like, just like the beggar, right? What was he begging for? He was begging for money. He wanted financial restoration. And yet, what was he given by God? Something so much better, right? Something he couldn't even imagine when he left the house that morning, right? Like, whole restoration physically, socially, spiritually. But how are we restored? How, like, what are the mechanics of our restoration? How does God do it? Well, oftentimes, God provides the means for our restoration, for our healing. So, for example, the beggar wasn't just, like, sitting at home waiting for God to heal him like that. No, God sent Peter. Peter was the means of God's restoration. And the beggar, he took hold of that opportunity. So, for us, we take hold of the opportunities when God gives it to us. And here's what I mean. Um, I hear kind of like horror stories of, of radical Christians who um, who are really built, who are really focused on this one idea of God that he is a supernatural healer, right? And I'm not saying he's not, but so they're but they're refusing to follow COVID restrictions and they don't take medicine because they're like, no, God will heal me directly. But what they don't understand is that these rules and, and this, these medicines, right? They're an extension of God's grace and provision to to us for healing. So God's restoration through medicine is just as amazing as God's uh, restoration through like supernatural healing. And we, we have to see God's graces and trust it in order to reach out like the beggar and accept the invitation of restoration offered to us. And, and just as God uses medicine for physical healing, God often uses people for restoration as well. That was the case for the beggar. God sent Peter. And that's definitely been the case for my life as well. 
So, so how do we start with this process of restoration? How do we accept God's changing work in our lives? Well, there are plenty of ways to do it, but I'm going to share one way um, that can be practical for you. So for myself, it's through the community of God, right? Through people. God works through his people to restore. So what has worked for me is to actually go out and intentionally schedule up a meetup, like a meeting with someone else, another Christian that I trust, right? And uh, I have to usually be pretty intentional about what I want to talk about with them because these deep, meaningful, substantial talks, they don't happen spontaneously, right? You have to actually um, push towards it. And, and we come and we talk about my brokenness, right? When I have a problem and we talk about solutions and we wrestle through my brokenness together. We see what the Bible has to say or what God's wisdom seen in other disciplines has to say. And then we see what answers we come up with. And I encourage you to do the same, right? Seek out conversation, work on problems together with other Christ followers. And, and that is a beautiful way of how God's restoration works in the world is through God's community. Our second point on what God wants to do with our brokenness is he wants us to share his story. So the Bible verses we're zoning in on are verses um, 9 and 10. Let me read it to you. <clears throat> when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called beautiful and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him so here's what's happening people know this man as the one who sits at the gate and begs all day unable to help himself and through god's restoration he came into the temple that he was pretty much banned from jumping and praising god and people saw this huge transformation and they were amazed right so through this one man's restoration and then through his story, many more lives were open to God's transforming work. See, once we're restored by God, we're actually, we actually become a part of the means that God uses to restore those around us. We get to join together with God to take care of others, to love them, um, to take care of them, and, and to lead them to Jesus. And we do this through our story. See, we're, whether it's intentional or not, we're always sharing some kind of story, right? We're always evangelizing something, right? I have this terrible, terrible habit where I find a restaurant I like and then I literally just tell everyone about it. I'm like, go here, it's so good. Um, and I realize Christine's usually annoyed about it. So then I'm like thinking to myself, why do I, why do, I do this? Why am I being annoying? And I share because I want others to experience the same experience that I enjoyed, the same pleasure I had at that restaurant. Uh, and here's another example. Um, during, so I gained a lot of weight during COVID and then I lost the weight. And then people were asking me, yo, what'd you do? How'd you do that? And I just said, well, I took in less calories than I burned every day, right? And that meant I was evangelizing this like fitness idea of calories in and calories out through my lifestyle, right? And where to do, where to share the story of Jesus um, for the same reason, so that they can experience the same joy and in the same way, right? Through words and through lifestyle. So I'm not saying just prepare a testimony, though that is important, but there's, there's so much more, right? Go and share the story of Jesus um, and how it has transformed you in the way you live and love. See, sharing his story doesn't mean every interaction with your friends has to be focused around Jesus talk. Like, I'm not going out there talking to my friends and, and like thinking, oh, how do I squeeze this Bible story in here so that I can like low-key evangelize to them? Um, no, that's, that's so forced and inorganic, right? But what it does mean is that every interaction has to be focused around Jesus's love. Right? We represent the person of Jesus to everyone through our lives. A few months ago, in one of our Bible studies, we were kind of examining what Jesus came to do and then how he did it. And it's based off of two verses in Luke. So the first one is Luke 19, 10. 
The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And then the second one is Luke 7, 34. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. See, Jesus had a mission, right? It was to restore those who were lost and broken. And when and we, we think usually that that's spiritual, right? He died spiritually so that they can be revived spiritually. And yes, it is, but it's so much more than that. Because if you look at the way Jesus did it, it was through eating and drinking with the lost. So he cared not only about the spiritual, but he cared about the physical, the social, the emotional, all aspects of life, and those all tie together with the spiritual. Just like with the beggar, right? Jesus cares about restoring people in all dimensions. And as his followers, we um, who try to become more and more like Jesus, we are also to take part in restoring people while considering all aspects of life. Throughout my life, uh, I've come across many different people, right, and many friends. So you really get to see what your friends are like when you're going through tough times. And I remember this one time, and it's kind of kind of pathetic to talk about, but I was going through like this heartbreak season, and I had people who kind of like wanted to help me, so they offered advice or they said stuff that I totally hated, right? So for example, it'll be like, "Oh, you shouldn't have been with her," and I'm like okay, yeah, you're right, yeah. Or at least you know for next time. And it's like, cool. Or uh, what I kind of hated the most is they like throw a Bible verse at me and it's like, great, thanks. I know, okay, you're right. I'm wrong. I messed up. It's obvious. And while to them, it was kind of just like an emotional, spiritual thing. Uh, to me, what that heartbreak was like, it was like a death of a friendship, right? And it hurt me in all aspects. And at the time I had one friend who stuck out because he didn't do all that lame stuff, right? Like he did it in subtle ways, but that was not the main way that he took care of me, right? He didn't even bring the situation up in conversation unless I brought it up. And even as I vented, he never made any judgmental comments or gave obvious advice. Instead, he took care of me as a friend, right? He encouraged me to do devotions together. Um, we went exploring throughout the city. He made me exercise and got me starting on volleyball again, invited me out to city events, and he really just got me living life again to get me out of my rut. And thinking back about it, this guy, he knew something about people, right? That when we are broken in one dimension, all dimensions are affected. And he did this because he was sharing the story of Jesus to me through his interactions with me, through his life. And thanks to that, God used him to restore me in that season. See, we are restored so that we can restore others. Like when we ask questions like, God, where, where are you in the world? Or how come you're not doing anything? The lesson we learn in the book of Acts is that God is working in the world through his people through us. So what does that mean for us? Do we just kind of accept God's restoration and love and then uh, do whatever we want? No, we actually get welcome to join God's mission of restoring the world one person at a time. And there are so many ways to do this, right? We, um, we do this through the effects of our restoration. So loving others, forgiving, being generous, sharing Jesus' story in our lives. And as we share the good news of God's love, we are welcoming other people who are broken and lost into the same invitation that God extends to us to be reconciled with God and to be restored. So do as Jesus did. right? Specifically, when we're talking about that Luke thing of how Jesus came to save the lost and how he did it was eating and drinking. Do as Jesus did. Right now, as you're listening to this message, think of someone you want to be Jesus to, right? To be a restorative force to. And then right after this message, actually send them a message, right? Do as Jesus did. Invite them to eat and drink in a safe manner that, you know, follow COVID guidelines, obviously. And, and be a restorative force to them or... Or and oftentimes they can restore you as well. Um, just a fun tip: if you're planning to do this online, like Zoom or Skype or Google Hangouts or whatever, what I found 
really helped is actually if you have a drink, like a physical drink, like tea or coffee or like hot water or something, and you just kind of sip it during the conversation. It, it's, for some reason, it makes the conversation seems like it makes it seem like you're in real life, right? It paces the conversation so it's not awkward. But that's just a fun tip. <laughs> and, and that's that's that concludes our message for today. We'll end with the recap. So what we focused on today was what does God do with our brokenness? What's his plan for our brokenness? And our, our answer was he wants to restore us and he wants us to share his story. So seek out conversations with mature Christians about your brokenness and seek out conversations with those who, you, who could be blessed by your story. And in all this, we are continually being restored as well as joining God's mission of restoring the world one person at a time. Let's respond by ending with the Lord's prayer. It goes like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thanks for joining us. Bye. See you next week.